<laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Foxwell. I am product manager at Zero Density. Um, if you don't know who Zero Density are, we are a SaaS solution for monitoring and alerting. Um, it's actually my first week at Zero Density, so if my new team are watching, hey, uh, I'll see you soon. Um, to start with, I'll just share a little bit about me. Um, so I've worked as a project manager, a program manager, um, company director, and a DevOps consultant um, most recently. And what I've found um, in every role I've ever done is the, the greatest challenges that we face as a team are not to do with the technology we're implementing, they're to do with the people that we're working with. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about resilience. Resilience is something I think we probably all understand quite well. Um, resilience is the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. And I'm guessing, because um, we're at Config Management Camp, that a lot of us spend a good portion of our time thinking about and designing resilient systems. Um, this is our job, right? Have we, have we ever configured a load balancer, backed up our data, um, built a cluster? These are things that are familiar to us, and we spend a lot of time thinking about them. But how often do we stop and think about our own resilience and the resilience of the people around us. So today I'm going to make a case for human resilience and why we need to spend more time thinking about that. The thing about people is we're really different to servers. Um, you're not immutable, <coughs> you're not highly available and you are ephemeral. Uh, there is no failover for you. There is no disaster recovery plan. And it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, everyone's got a breaking point. Uh, people are more difficult to work with than machines. And when you break a person, he can't be fixed. I'm not going to ask for raised hands um, or anything on this subject because it's very personal. But I know that there will be people in this room that have suffered stress in the workplace. I know that there will be people in this room who have had burn, who have had burnout at certain points in their career, or have known people that have. Um, this is sort of one of the sad realities of the field we work in at the moment, that these are the things that we need to worry about. And I want to say at the outset that this is not a talk um, about what's wrong with you. Uh, this is a talk about how we can all improve our resilience together. Because it turns out that resilience isn't something that's innate. Um, you don't have it or not have it. It's actually a set of skills that can be learned and developed. And that's what we're <coughs> going to talk about today. But before we get on to the skills you need to be resilient, I'm going to talk about change for a while. Because change is inevitable. Um, in the course of my career, I've seen teams go through huge amounts of change, um, transformational change in a lot of cases. And the thing about change is that people are a little bit different to our systems, and yet we don't treat them as such. You do not simply upgrade a human. There is no A-B switch in your head that says, OK, I'm going to switch over to DevOps mode tomorrow. Today, I'm going to be cloud native. Uh, th these things just don't happen. Actually, it takes a lot of time and a lot of learning uh, to adapt yourself to the changes around you in technology. But we still, <coughs> but we still treat these changes as, as we would a software delivery project. And that takes a toll on our people. We thought we could fix everything with engineering, but it turns out that we need a different set of skills in order to deliver change effectively within our teams. Some of the changes that you may have been through in your career, um, agile, offshoring, automation, um, going to the cloud, DevOps, uh, behavior-driven de development, continuous delivery, and uh, dare I say it, containers. Uh, these are all transforming the way we work. And when we make changes, it takes a toll on our people. And in the course of my career, I've come to realize something, that the only thing that we can really rely on is that we will keep changing. <coughs> Technology will keep changing. It will keep changing at an ever-increasing rate. And if we are not adaptable and flexible, uh, we will struggle. So this is, this is a talk about how we 
prepare ourselves for that change. And I wanted to talk about, um, and I wanted to talk about my first day of work in this context because um, on my first day of work, my first day of real work, when I left university um, and I started on a graduate training program. Um, we were all, uh, me and the other graddies, were shipped off to a nice country hotel and we had a lot of very corporate brainwashing, um, not brainwashing, of course, induction, um, to, <laughs> to talk us through the company strategy, the vision for the future, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't remember anything about that day apart from this one chap that came in and he talked about the well of despair. Um, so... The well of despair is part of the emotional cycle of change. And what he told us was that leaving university and going into the workplace was a huge life change. And we should expect to experience the well of despair at some point. We would be ambitious and positive at the start, but soon we would feel like we were not good enough. Soon we would start to struggle and um, not see a future there. We would go through this at uh, different stages and to a different extent, but we would go through it. And that was really powerful. The fact that he came in and he warned us about the emotional cycle of change and that we would experience um, this sort of slump of motivation at some point um, made it okay for us to talk about it. And that's what we did um, as a group of graduates. Instead of pretending we were all right, pretending we were like um, adapting fantastically, we would slump down at lunchtime and complain that we were in the well of despair and we'd seek help from each other. And that was very powerful. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the emotional cycle of change. Um, has anyone seen this before? We've got a couple of hands. Awesome. Um, so you're familiar with this. So when we're making a change, it doesn't really matter what the change is um, because it, it will be significant to different people in different ways. But we start with the wonderful peak of uninformed optimism. Everything is wonderful. This will be easy. Um, we're going to make this change and it's going to be fantastic. And then things get a bit real. So you come across a few challenges. We then start to go down into the informed pessimism um, stage of the emotional cycle. Um, this is when you start to come across barriers and challenges and the informed pessimism can result in you slumping down into the well of despair. The well of despair is not a very nice place because the well of despair is when you start to feel like things are impossible. Um, you don't see a way forward. You might feel like you want to give up. Sometimes you actually do give up and just abandon the change that you're uh, trying to initiate. But if you keep going, uh, you start to climb back up into hopeful realism. So maybe you've met a few challenges, maybe you've changed tack, maybe uh, you see a route through and you don't have all the answers yet. And then of course we get to rewarding completion. Awesome, let's have a party. Um, has anyone experienced this sort of emotional cycle recently in their work? Or yeah, I've got a few. Yeah, I think I think most people have. And here's the um, here's the thing that I feel about this wonderful peak of rewarding completion. It's like we don't get to we don't get to experience that very much in our world. As soon as you've got your head around one change, there's another change coming through that's going to throw you straight back down into that well of despair. We never stop learning and we never stop changing. So I feel like the emotional cycle of change for us is actually more like a roller coaster. Um, we are constantly trying to keep up with technology. We're constantly trying to keep up with new pr practices. We're constantly trying to be better. Um, that can take its toll. That can take its toll on anyone. And we need to look after ourselves um, in order to survive this roller coaster. Resilience. How do we how do we change these wells of despair into mere bumps in the road? Resilience. The ability to recover quickly from difficulties. And the thing about resilience um, that I mentioned earlier, resilience is a set of skills that can be learned. Um, some people are more resilient than others. If you want to be more resilient, you can work on those skills and you can become more resilient as a person. 
Resilience is not a trait that either people have or do not have. It involves behaviours, thoughts and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. Um, I think just knowing this brings it back into your control and makes you realise that you can do something about it when you're suffering um, or when you're facing setbacks or when you're stressed. It was a um, study started in 1955 by developmental psychologist Emmy Warner that first identified some of these um, traits of resilience. What she did was she followed a group of people um, from birth um, for four decades into their 40s. And some of these people, um, they experienced stress and trauma during their lives, as you would expect. Um, but what really interested her was why some people reacted differently to these stressful events than others. What was it that made some people succeed in adversity and others falter? Um, and it turns out that it was resilience. A psychologist called Garmezi um, coined the term protective factors, and he really um, turned the whole study of resilience around. Instead of looking for negative reasons why people failed in the face of challenges, he started to look for the positive reasons why some people succeed. Um, protective factors are the elements of an individual's environment, background or personality that enable success despite the challenges faced. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about protective factors because there are some that you can develop within yourself and there are some that you can deliver to the people around you that you can provide. Um, that will help them build their resilience and you build yours. It turns out that having an internal locus of control is a huge factor in your resilience. Um, locus, by the way, is a Latin word for location. What we're talking about here is where you perceive the control in your life to be. And perceive is an important word here because um, two people could be experiencing exactly the same situation, but how they perceive that situation makes all the difference. When you have an internal locus of control, you believe that the outcomes of a situation are within your control, determined by your hard work, attributes and decisions. If you have an external locus of control, the outcomes are outside of your control, determined by fate um, and independent of your hard work and decisions. You can imagine that somebody who falls into this left-hand category would feel helpless um, in the face of adversity, whereas the person on the right might feel more positive, they might take action about it. It's the difference in the way you think about things. The person on the left is saying, this is impossible, whereas the person on the right is saying, this feels impossible right now, so I'll take some steps to understand it better. And the way you frame challenges in your own mind essentially can influence um, where your locus of control is. And everyone's on the spectrum, obviously. Um, some people are a long way to the right, some people are a long way to the left. But we can do something about this as a group as well. And it was only a matter of time before I mentioned culture, because a culture of trust um, and a team where you have autonomy to make decisions is going to influence whether or not you feel you have control of a situation yourself, whether you have that internal locus of control. Um, if you have a culture of trust and autonomy, you're more likely to have an internal locus of control. You're more likely to feel in control of the outcomes around you. And you're more likely to be a resilient person. Uh, if you have top-down management, if changes are done to you and you feel like you have no control at all, you're more likely to slip, slip into that well of despair. So what else can we do to improve our resilience? Um, we've talked about how we can do some things within ourselves and our own thought patterns, and we've talked about how the right culture um, can influence our teams. And I'm going to make a, quite, quite a bold statement. I'm going to say that, you know what, we're, we're at a conference. Um, some people have travelled a long way to be here. Um, you're here to connect with people. You're here to learn new skills. I think possibly as a group, we're probably more resilient than most. We're taking action to adapt and to learn. 
But that's not the case for everyone. Um, there's a lot of people in our industry right now that are, that are suffering. Um, maybe it's the sysadmin with 20 years of experience that needs to learn how to automate themselves out of a job. Um, maybe it's the network team who don't really understand what their place is once their organization migrates to the cloud. Uh, maybe it's whole IT departments trying to get their head around serverless and what that means for them. Um, there's a lot of people in a state of potentially anxiety um, at the moment, and I think we as a community um, can help those people. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can help others build their resilience now. And it turns out the most important thing you can do is just take an interest. Um, by caring, listening and supporting, you can make a huge difference to an individual's resilience. It doesn't matter who they are. It could be your team, it could be your peers, um, it could even be your superiors, your managers and your directors, um, seeking help within your community, your family and your friends. Just by being there, you can make a difference to how people cope with change. Um, and I think that's very powerful. And what can we do in our workplace to improve the resilience of the people around us? We can support each other, obviously. I've talked about that. We can be there and listen. We can make sure that people have a voice and they voice their concerns. Um, we can trust people and give them autonomy. Uh, this, is, this is what I've talked about earlier, and it helps people develop that internal locus of control. Change is happening, but I can have an impact on the outcome. That will help them be more resilient in the face of change. Providing the team with a sense of purpose, understanding that each individual contributes towards the whole, that is very important. We're not just managing tickets on a board, and not understanding um, what the impact of those changes are. We need to give the people around us a reason um, to, do, to do their job and a reason to care. Focusing on the opportunity and being positive about changes is really important. Um, so, it's very easy, and I think I've found this in my career, to say, this is impossible, it will never work here. Finding reasons why it cannot be done, um, instead of finding reasons why it can. Uh, being optimistic and confident in the face of setbacks as well. So maybe things aren't going to plan, um, but hey, that's, that's kind of expected. Um, not, nothing ever goes to plan. We always have setbacks. Um, it's how you react in the face of those challenges that will make a difference to the resilience of your team. And if you have a big enough organization, build a community. Uh, if you can't provide that supportive, caring relationship to everybody around you, build a community so that you can all support each other. Uh, that can be a really powerful agent of change in any organization. So, what about you and your own resilience? Because if you're burnt out and you're stressed, you're not going to be in a place where you can really support the people around you. There are things you can do that improve your resilience, uh, and they're actually quite easy. Um, you can practice mindful meditation. I know that this is something that we all talk about a lot, but actually building it into your routine and dedicating time to it is quite hard. But the benefits of it are that you become more aware. You become more aware of yourself and of the people around you. That makes you better at listening and identifying those people who might need support. It also improves your cognitive flexibility and ability to solve problems, which, you know, who doesn't want that? Make sure you take breaks. Um, don't burn out yourself either. Um, look after yourself. You can only concentrate for maybe 90, to, 90 minutes to two hours at a time on any one task before you start to uh, lose productivity. So make sure you take breaks and don't beat yourself up for doing it either because actually it will improve your overall productivity. Take notice of your thoughts. Um, this is easier said than done, but when you're thinking, I am stressed, I am unhappy, try to reframe that. Try to reframe that as, I am feeling stressed. I wonder why. I wonder, <laughs> I'm feeling stressed because X, Y, Z. Um, just separating yourself from your feelings ever so slightly can have a big impact on how you respond to them. 
and it can stop you slipping into that well of despair. Goes without saying, look after your health. Um, drink as much Belgian beer as you want tonight, but don't do it every day. Um, when you go back to work, try and drink water, exercise, um, eat healthily. Um, we can't, we can't live our whole lives as though we're at a conference, unfortunately. Um, otherwise, it will impact on our, our well-being. And talk about it. So I've mentioned how being there for other people, for them to share their feelings and their thoughts about changes is important. But you yourself, you also need to know when you need to ask for help. Um, and it's not something that we're very good at, but it is... Um, one of the main things you can do to improve your resilience in the face of challenges, having people you can talk to. And on that note, I'm here for the next two days and I'm actually a really good listener. If anybody out there actually wants to talk through something with me, I don't necessarily have the answers for you, but talking to someone and talking through the problem can be incredibly useful. So come find me. I'm like totally here for you. So I'll wrap up today um, by saying that the well-being of human operators impacts the reliability of our systems. We know this to be true. We only have to look at the incident with GitLab um, a couple of weeks ago to know this to be true. The resilience of your human operators impacts the resilience of your systems. The health of your infrastructure is a lot more than just hardware and software and uptime. It's about the health and well-being of your team as well. Automation has got us so far, but your platforms cannot exist without your people. So next time you're at your desk thinking about resilience, I urge you to give a thought to human resilience as well, because resilient systems require resilient people. Thank you. How long was that? We can do questions. Or not. <laughs> yes, hi. Uh, you're talking about autonomy and support. And for me, it's always a, a problem to figure out the, the, the sweet spot between those two. Because on the one hand, to leave people alone doing them things on their own is fine. But when do I find a nice way of supporting them when uh, they seem to get stuck or when they might need help. Do you know what okay, I'll repeat the question. So the, the question was, um, how do you support people who might need help whilst also giving the, them the autonomy to solve the problems themselves? Um, I think... For me, if you're, a, if you're a team leader or a leader in your organization, there's um, a huge benefit that you can get from learning a few coaching skills, um, through leading people through that process of problem solving. Um, instead of just giving them the answer, um, they might know you know the answer, and they might, just, just be, they might just be like, hey, tell me the answer, I don't have time for this. But if you do have time for it, help them through that problem solving process. They're more likely to remember um, how they solve the problem and use those skills next time. Um, and also, they're more likely to feel in control of the outcome, um, which is so much better than you saying, hey, we're going to the cloud or whatever, just, just do it. Um, because no one feels good about getting directives like that. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Hello. Um, what do you do when supporting other people doesn't fit into your team structure or planning process or agile or scrum thing? Well, so supporting people is outside of the process. Um, okay, so the question was, what happens when supporting people around you is not part of your planning process, whether it be Agile or Scrum? Or, um, I think that's really sad. Why? Why, <laughs> why would that be the case? Um, I, I, this is a sort of related point to what you're saying, but I mean, if you're in an office with people, it's really easy to see when, when um, your colleagues around you are struggling. If you're working distributed um, and remotely, it can be quite hard, and you actually do need to ask those questions um, about how people are doing, and you need to, 
you need to look for signs that they need more help than they're getting. Um, I don't think I don't think we, as people, um, need to let process stand in the way of this. I mean, processes like blameless post-mortems and retrospectives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they can help um, to create a forum for these dialogues, but. It depends on how comfortable people feel about talking. People might feel more comfortable talking one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know whether that answered. Did that answer your question? No, he's shaking his head. <laughs> I'm going to come and talk to you after. <laughs> oh, he's getting a hug. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> any other questions? I can't see any hands. Thank you very much for having me. This has been awesome.